and welcome to the Katie Helper Show. I'm your host, Katie Helper, and I'm always joined by... That's me, Gabe Pacheco, here today, present. Make sure you join our Patreon, patreon.com slash the Katie Helper Show. Again, that's patreon.com slash the Katie Helper Show. Definitely uh, rate and review us on iTunes if you have the time. Uh, we really appreciate it. You can start writing your review right now before you even get home. Just open up uh, notes on your yes. phone and write the review in notes on your phone and then copy and paste that and send that to iTunes. We we uh, appreciate any feedback we get. It helps push us up in the ratings yeah. and uh, makes us visible to more people so we can keep sharing and spreading this uh, alternative message. Yeah, the go- spreading the gospel. Maybe we should do an episode where we walk people through it. I think some people don't know how to do it. Hey, guys, if you don't know how to rate and review on iTunes, Google it. Gabe, is, you know, is, is it surprising that he used to be a teacher? <laughs> no. On today's episode of the Katie Helper Show, we talked to the Trill Billy Workers Party podcast. Three people who have a really cool podcast about Appalachia. We also have our next live taping June 14th at 7 p.m. at the Brooklyn Commons. That's 388 Atlantic Avenue. And our guest will be Angela Nagel, author of Kill All Normies, and Freddie DeBoer, writer and all-around controversial dude. How's it going, Gabe? You know, I woke up today, and the first thing I did was walk outside of my apartment door, and someone or something had taken an incredibly large dump. (laughs) No. It was huge. And uh, I didn't know what it was. I mean, it was either a human who'd had a very large meal or some some sort of like a mastiff. A mastiff, right. Yeah. So, but, you know, that's just kind of one of those annoying things that happens when you live in a metropolis. Right. And everyone's on top of one another. Every dog, everyone. Totally. Mastiffs are just a huge animal with, uh, they're so big that they get heart problems. Really? Yeah. Oh, that's so sad. Yeah. But they, they are definitely a great uh, ornament to have walking down the street. Everyone wants to pet your mastiff. Well, you know what's interesting, Gabe? My parents, you may have seen on my Instagram, my Twitter, my Facebook, my parents have a dog who I, kind of is like my little sister. A I'm mastiff an only child. would eat your dog. Well, they actually would work together. You know why? Tell me. Because Bodhi, whose name is real name is Bodhisattva, is a Tibetan Lhasa Apsa. They were bred to protect Tibetan monks. Yeah. And they would work with the Mastiffs. So the Mastiffs were like the attack dogs, and little Bobos, little Bodhis, were the warning dogs, which is why they're really, they can be really yappy, and they're very alert, because they're listening for sounds of people entering the monastery to attack the monks. Or, uh, they're, yeah, maybe they're listening for the sounds of uh, Chinese exactly. uh, nationalists trying to invade Tibet. Right. I, I guess they were asleep at the wheel. Or maybe little dogs <laughs> can't compete with the Chinese uh, military. That's right. Yeah. Those weren't around when they were breeding them. I, I went to a free Tibet concert when? as a kid. Oh, yeah. Yeah, in uh, the RFK Stadium in D.C. And right in the middle of uh, a performance... A lightning bolt came down and struck someone in the crowd, and uh, then then no, there was no performance after that for like half an hour, and all of the fans started getting pretty ugly, you know, almost like Woodstock '99 style, where they were took their shirts off and started running around down in the pit in front of the stage, waiting for a show, and then Michael Stipe had to come out and tell everyone. to go home. It just ended? It just ended. It's the end of the world as we know it. It's the end of the world as we know it. But this, it was so annoying because it was supposed to be a two-day festival. This was the first day. And he says, sorry, the show's canceled, everybody. But if you have tickets for tomorrow, come then. If you don't, uh, just remember, this is for charity. No. Everybody heard. Sometimes. As though anybody really cared about Tibet. They just wanted to see KRS-One and the Beastie Boys. They would have been like lock-up Tibet. They would have gone to a lock-up Tibet. Honestly, it turned me off freeing Tibet. That's me in the spot, like my religion. Yeah, I know. Michael You're Stipe like... single-handedly turned me off of freeing Tibet. You're like, I now donate to China, to the <laughs> Chinese, uh, what is it? Do they have a special like uh, Tibet? Wing of the army? Big fan of China. Yeah. I'll tell you that right now. I just went to the uh, pharmacy, Dwayne Reed. I got myself a, an electric massager because, you know, I get tense and uh, it was made in China. And I thought, man, $9 for this and I never have to go back to get a real uh, massage. Oh, yeah. We'll see how it works. Yeah. 
You'll have to let us know. We're going to have to check in with you next week. <laughs> next week. When you're really happy, happy. Then you're going to be a totally different person. <laughs> I didn't know KRS-One was there. I mean, was into that. I know the Beastie Boys, big time. Yeah, big it, was, time it was huge. They assembled a, a, a really... A Tribe Called Quest was there as well. I saw the Dalai Lama at the Beacon Theater in... Um, uh, in Manhattan, on the Upper West Side. How was that? It was good, and he kept saying, "I have to look it up." He kept saying an expression like, "Yes, you know, like not my man," which is what I will jo- will call you sometimes when I'm introducing right, you and right. the show, M- or my main man. But he kept saying something. I have to look it up. He was I like, think what's it's up, my it. guy? Yeah, kind of. Oh man, what was it? My dude. My dude. Like or uh huh or it's cool. Something super colloquial and surprising. He was like, "Home skillet, come on Some, up here." Something like Get that. Get a yeah. hug from the Dalai Lama. Yeah. The big uh, DL. The big DL. Um, did the person die when no, they were struck by lightning? Okay. I looked them up online. They're like a lawyer now. Really? Maybe a personal everybody, injury lawyer, huh? <laughs> everybody can Google this lightning strike free Tibet concert, and it wow. it comes up. Um, also, I guess we have to talk about it's very sad. Ah, uh, yes. The um, what if I was like the uh, album that just came out from Insert Pop Band, and that's what I meant. Just kidding. This is not funny. The Manchester Arena attack. Serious. Serious. It was an Ariana Grande uh, show. So this was a suicide bombing. Yes. You know, remember like years ago, I don't know if you remember this, but um, Bill Maher got, got in trouble when he had that show, Politically Incorrect. And he said something, I guess they had been talking about the 9-11 hijackers. That's right. Lots of people were calling them cowards. And he said, you know, call them what you will, they're not cowards. We have been the cowards, lobbing cruise missiles from 2,000 miles away. Absolutely. That's cowardly. That, that is a Staying family. in the airplane yes. when it hits the building. Say what you want about it, not cowardly. And there's something, obviously, like, I don't want to say brave because I don't want to glorify it, but there's, I mean, I'm sure it takes a lot of... You know, well, people say uh, suicide is the cowardly way out, so maybe, you know, I think they're conflating those two ideas. Yeah. But, uh... If you really believe that you're going to get 72 versions, right? Yeah. Like, it's not that, that brave, but I feel like even the most religious people have, have to have some anxiety, some shakes... Mm-hmm. Butterflies in the stomach. Oh my god, that's so terrible! But yeah, pre-suicide bomb. Butterflies in the stomach. Don't we're going to donate the um, profits from this episode? I mean, it's a it's a horrible situation, yeah. and um, you know, it just makes me uh, a little bit more apprehensive about going out and crowd. Well, I, I, I would love to be able to say that I can't go into crowded places, but we are recording close to Times Square right. today in a studio, so uh, we're Gabe always is sweating buckets. We're yeah, I live you know living in New York City. We are this is where the target really is. For uh, at least in my mind, if something's going to happen, it's, it's, uh, um, it's you know, next. especially after you know, I feel like uh, living through the war on terror at its uh, genesis in like the early two thousands. Right. This idea that um, that middle America was going to be the target is has always been absurd to me. Right. And the only time that middle America is targeted is by uh, white extremists, True. like Oklahoma City with right. uh, Timothy McVeigh. Right. So um, really, the heartland uh, has to not look uh, for external enemies, but uh, look round look up at, people. Yeah, from within. <laughs> look at the look at the uh, you know the the guys who are melanin deficient at the gun shows. Yes, handing out the pamphlets. Yeah, and give them some vitamin D and a hug, and hope <laughs> hope that solves their their woes and that they don't take them out in a worse way. Yeah. Um, yeah, and then of course the terrible stabbing of a student. Richard Wilbur Collins, a senior at Bowie State University, who was visiting UMD, University of Maryland, during graduation weekend. Collins, 23, was set to graduate from Bowie State University on Tuesday. He was commissioned as a second lieutenant in the U.S. Army just days before his death. Sean Christopher Urbanski, a 22-year-old student at the University of Maryland, has been charged with first and secondary murder as well as first-degree assault following the recent slaying of Richard Wilbur Collins, a senior at Bowie State University. And they discovered that he was connected to something called Alt Reich Nation, a racist Facebook group that posts disparaging content about African Americans and other minority groups. Oh my God! So yeah, it's really terrible. Um, right. So he awful. was going to go and be be of service to the country. Yeah. When he was brutally murdered by a deranged. Alt, alt-right? By a white supremacist. There was a really haunting photo. I don't know if you saw this. Sean King posted a really haunting photo on Instagram of, like, the empty seat of the student, Richard Wilbur Collins, and it was before the graduation. You see his robe, his cap and gown yeah. on the seat. It's really chilling and haunting. 
we I really feel like there hasn't been a good like I don't we should have someone on who specializes in hate crime prevention and reduction. I'm not kidding. I know that sounds like absurd, but I have no idea what the solution is. Yeah. I mean, we always talk about systemic things, right? Which obviously I think help on a general level, but I don't know. And this isn't a gun violence thing, right? Like uh, liberals and and some of the left, we always kind of say like, oh, look, we have to change our gun laws, which I think is true, even though some on the left have this weird like. I mean, I got a lot of family out in the out in the west right. in the uh, Rocky Mountains, and I, I meet you a said lot of Rocky Mountains. In the Iraq, I've got a lot of Iraqi friends yeah. who don't want to give up their guns. Right? No, I, have I a can lot understand of, that. <laughs> so I'm I'm on the fence. I don't know right. where I stand on this. Uh, you you know you can't have guns in New York City. Well, it's also a question so, of what kind, right? I mean, it's semi-automatic right. or automatic versus. What do, what do they shoot rifles? You know, like a bolt, like a bolt action. Yeah, you know, musket. Just get musket, a musket. Yeah, we could all have muskets. Anyway, it's very very sad. He's very he looks very sweet. I mean, he looks really handsome. The nice thing is that uh, they actually show a, a photo of him in a in his military jacket, and so they show a nice photo of him because often they'll show terrible photos of black people, and especially if they've been murdered by the police. Yeah, well, that yes. right. So the guy who killed him is not a police officer. They show a mugshot of this guy, of the guy. I think it's a mugshot. Actually, I'm not sure it's a mugshot. At least they don't show him like in a, in like wearing a tuxedo, or they did with that guy, that rapist, um, the blonde guy who... Oh, um, uh, Brock Turner. Yeah, Brock Turner, yeah. Never forget, Brock Turner, yeah. rapist. Rapist, who the Washington Post wrote the most sympathetic thing about. Like, poor guy, he, he was set to be a successful swimmer. When yeah, he, can't when enjoy he his got steaks himself, anymore. I know. When he got himself... Um, all mixed up in all the mixed up uh, behind the dumpster raping. rape yeah, scene. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Poor guy. Poor guy. He you know, really... that, that scene just draws you right in. Yeah, gateway. Gateway rape scene. Here we go! I watched on Netflix the Roger Stone documentary. The film is called Get Me Roger Stone? Yeah. How was it? It was fantastic. Uh, not that he is uh, no, fantastic. It really was a character sketch of of the devil <laughs> personally charismatic uh well-dressed uh salesman uh, he reminds me of what like puritan wood carvings uh say when they describe the devil coming to steal your soul in like witchcraft trials yeah i wish he had been around during the salem witch trial and had been convicted and thrown into the what did they do they throw you into the water this is a great great move if you sink you're not a witch and if you float, you are. So then they kill you. Right. Yeah. It's very uh, fail-proof uh, way to deal with it. Alien versus predator situation yeah. right there. Either way, you're going to lose. Right. I mean, if people haven't seen the documentary, you, you get to see a political operative who was around during Nixon's campaign and then Ronald Reagan's campaign and then worked with Buchanan and Dole and uh, and now Trump. And we see an echo uh, goes through all of these campaigns, this sort of common thread of negativity. And you see him talking about making America great and being tough on crime. And those two threads, which are now wholeheartedly in Trump's uh, worldview, started off you know, back in the Nixon days. Which is still funny because we've come so far, gone so backwards that it's funny to think Nixon, who's horrible, obviously, was impeached and actually had to step down. Like, he was better on health care and the EPA. Right. It seems like, you know, in, in the biographies that I've read on Nixon that he, um, you know, uh, used a dirty politics and a race baiting. Uh, but And he, he still had... Ideas that the government uh, had had functions and and did want to implement policies right. that 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 worked to uh, benefit and and rise up, you know the the collective right. and uh, the Republican Party has moved farther and farther into this uh, dismantling like nihilism. Right. right. They would have. They probably would have called Nixon a communist. Yeah. Perhaps. Well, the EPA and affirmative action and yeah. giving money to the uh, National Endowment of the Arts. Um. Yeah, and in fact, I just really quickly, there's an article on Alternet. If Nixon were alive today, he would be far too liberal to get even the Democratic nomination. <laughs> and they have a quote from, guess who said this, ready? I'll give you a hint. Richard Nixon was our last liberal president. He talks like this, and he's... Um... Shout outs to Hank Kissinger. No, no, but close. He's But he's on the other side of the this political spectrum. Oh, Noam Chomsky. Yes, Noam Chomsky, yeah. 
Um, How is it that when you do that voice, I'm either like, oh, it's got to be Kissinger yeah. or Chomsky. Right. Your so voice blood. is an empty symbol that yeah, I can just it is, fill yeah. with whatever meaning. Well, if I talk, I think they, they both have this thing, but one has a German accent and one, and one has no, you know, doesn't have the German accent. Um, anyway, but he got us out of Vietnam. He was a keen foreign policy type whose diplomatic efforts strengthened our relationship with both established and emerging world powers. He implemented the first significant federal affirmative action program. He dramatically increased spending on federal employee salaries. He oversaw the first large-scale integration of public schools in the South. He proposed a guaranteed annual wage, a.k.a. a negative income tax. Um, He imposed wage and price controls. Uh, He indexed Social Security for inflation. He created the EPA and OSHA, Occupational Safety and Health Administration, the National Oceanic Atmosphere Administration, and the Office of Minority Business Enterprises. He promoted the Legacy of Parks program. He appointed four Supreme Court justices. Three of them voted with the majority in Roe v. Wade. Wow. And he advocated comprehensive national health insurance. Wow. For all Americans. So he's to the left of Hillary Clinton. That's cray. He also thought that um, Rehnquist was a Jew, like the judge Rehnquist. He was working for, I guess, in the Justice Department at the time or clerking for someone. And he's like, who's that that wrench, that guy Wrenchberg instead of Rehnquist? And, you know, he talks about how he wore these ridiculous outfits. Um, Yeah, it's fascinating. I mean, if people haven't seen the documentary, I wholeheartedly recommend it. And I actually saw Roger Stone without realizing it because I was distracted. This was at the RNC when I had a little run in with Alex Jones. Um, what was cool is that I videotaped it and he videotaped it, which I didn't know. So I found we both have, you know what I should do? I should edit them, cross cut them. We a great piece of cinema. I ran into Alex Jones at, um, in Cleveland at the RNC, just on the street. Yeah. I was wearing a little sundress. I think that's why I was able to infiltrate his like militia. Yeah. That's your deep cover uniform. Yeah. Yeah. Basically even in the winter yeah. when it's snowing, I just wear a little sundress. Um, but it's really funny. I, I like went up to him and I was like, hi, how are you doing? Um, can I are you enjoying yourself just to I had to stall because, again, I wasn't prepared to see him. I ran into him on the street. And yeah. so I was like, can I ask you a question? Sure. Are you enjoying yourself? Are you enjoying yourself? That's my small talk. And he pivoted right away. He's like, yeah, I, I like standing up against tyranny. Yeah. And where do you think the biggest threat of tyranny is coming from? From the globalists that are running our government on the ground. Like, he's good at turning small talk into politics right away. You know, he's on his toes. Gets you right on message. Yeah, exactly. And then I ask him about, like, who he's supporting. You know, obviously. There's no choice. Trump's all the way. But then there's a guy with him who's like, Hillary's a witch. She's a Jezebel. We know what she's like. Hillary's a witch. She's in witchcraft. She's a Jezebel. Yeah, we're we're supporting it. We all know who she is. Okay. It's really funny. And then I asked him what he meant by something about how Hillary... She wants to mount America's head on the wall. Oh, okay. I was like, what does that mean policy-wise? And he's like... I mean, she just wants to piss all over the country and dominate everything like a big fat goblin. Like a big fat goblin? And I started laughing because it made me laugh, but yeah. um, I, I, I don't know if he thought that I... You were encouraging him. Yeah, exactly. I was like, keep going. Big fat goblin, what else you got? Uh, troll, gnome, whatever. But I didn't notice Roger Stone was at the front of the pack and wearing like a Bill Clinton rapist-in-chief shirt. Yeah, it was just uh, looked... Like the Obama right. Hope shirt, right, right, but it's right. Bill Clinton's face, and then it's just Shepherd says rape or whatever underneath. Oh, just rape. Oh, right, yeah. it's rape instead of hope. That's great. They're very <laughs> clever. So, did you fall in love with him at all? Uh, oh no, hmm. no, he's uh, he's a devil. I mean, he was like I said. Uh, the thing about him that seemed, you know, interesting is that he he seemed very good natured and uh, uh, friendly and uh, dynamic. You can see why, um, you know, sometimes uh, the PR guys are. <laughs> the devil is cooler in person. There's so many horrible things that that this guy did. Like uh, he was part of the torture lobby. So uh, right after working on uh, Nixon's political campaign and Reagan's campaign, he decided to go into being a lobbyist with uh, two other dudes. So it was uh, Bla- uh, Black uh, Manafort and Stone. And Manafort, Paul Manafort, who was also part of uh, Trump's campaign. Right. So the three of those guys uh, went in together and they... Uh, worked as a lobby taking money from third world dictators in Africa and Latin America. They're anti-racist. And, uh, <laughs> They're doing anti-racist work, doing the work. <laughs> yeah, so just lo- lobbying on the side of the worst. I mean, they are like, it's like Al Pacino from Devil's Advocate. And, uh, oh, but one one way they really tried to show him in a positive light, very, very briefly, was they said he's a very good family man. Like, they show his, his grandkids love him. And uh, I think it's funny when we... Uh, when people shield themselves behind the cloak of of being great uh, to their kids, right. 
um, as though that that should leave us from judging them on like the impact they have on society as a whole. Yeah, Hitler apparently like liked animals and was a vegetarian or something. Yeah, I mean you think about that German Shepherd Blondie, and you're like, oh, Who's that? adorable. That was Hitler's dog, Blondie. Yeah, really, he named mm-hmm. her Blondie. Uh huh. Um, was it like in English Blondie or was it like Blund ich whatever being German? You know, that's something for hey man. Next episode. Yeah, email us. Let yeah, us know. Email us. Yeah. Um, Anybody who has trivia on Hitler's dog. Blondie. We'd, we'd love to hear about Did it. She, was she in the bunker with them? Oh, man, Blondie. I, I think Blondie had to uh, gobble a, a, a cyanide Scooby oh snack. My God. <laughs> That's awful. Poor Blondie. Um, a, and Ava Braun. I didn't realize they got married. It was so romantic. Like an hour or 24 hours before <laughs> they, they killed themselves. I, if, if people haven't seen Downfall, yeah. <laughs> I love that movie. That's, of course, the movie. It's a great movie, Bruno Gantz, and it also gave birth to that meme of, you know, um, <laughs> Hitler's Hitler friends to... don't go to Burning Man. That's my favorite oh, one. Hitler to reacts that. to, like, people not going to Burning Man with him. Uh, oh, that's, yeah, I did one where it was um, <laughs> Hitler reacts to, and I didn't, I'm a little too literal sometimes, but I did one to when, I don't know if you remember, <laughs> Nicki Minaj had that video called Only. And it was very, it was full of Nazi imagery. Man, fool, he just ate. I don't duck nobody but tape. Yeah, that was a setup for a punchline on duct tape. Yeah. And so I had Hitler react to that, and he was very upset about it. Um, about uh, about her culturally appropriating yes, right. his Hugo Boss yeah, uniforms. Yeah, exactly, yeah. And he was actually, he was like a big fan of Nicki Minaj's, but he hated Drake, who's also in that video. Sure. Um, so the question is, what part of Drake does Hitler hate more? He thinks he's derivative, I believe, is how I made it happen. Yeah. It's really funny how those, I mean, I'm not talking, mine just blows them all out of the water. No, not at all. I just mean it's funny how something like that can be so funny and you can use it in so many different contexts. Yeah. That was a pretty corny thing to say. An empty uh, symbol. Yeah, an empty symbol, yeah. So, um, should we talk, should we call up our guests? The Trill Billy Workers Party podcast. Tom Sexton, Tanya Turner, Terrence Ray. Oh, yeah, man. Uh, I love those guys. I like all I listen to now is podcasts. Uh, these guys are great. Uh, Street Fight is another fantastic podcast uh, coming out of Columbus, and I love. Li- and podcasts to me are like the true American voices mm. from all over, and uh, they're not uh, mediated uh, through uh, gatekeepers in New York and L.A. And um, it just gives the voices on the left. Uh, it shows the diversity, right, and uh, the regional nature um, and inclusivity of the left. Because, uh, you know, I, I listen to a lot of leftists in New York talk and, you know, they're, they're real liberal or whatever. But on, honestly, I go, what do you do? And they go, I uh, I do a commercial copy editing right. for Coca-Cola. And right. I'm like, oh, so you work for the demon the monster de- the and you're looking child, down right. on uh, working class people in the middle of the country right. when, you know, come on. Hello. Hello. This is Katie Halper. Hey, hey Katie Halper. And? It's Gabe Pacheco. Hey, Gabe. Hey. Hey, guys. How are you? Hanging in there. What about y'all? We're good. We're big fans of the show. <laughs> so, so tell us about how you started your podcast. <laughs> how and why? Honestly, it's really kind of uh, anticlimactic. Really, like we had just wanted to roast that um, J.D. Vance book for uh, the longest time. When you say the J.D. Vance book, uh, for our listeners um, who don't know who that is, who is who are we talking about? J.D. Vance is a, a best-selling author of the book Hillbilly Elegy. He's a Yale-educated attorney and a retainer of water. <laughs> <laughs> Did he double major in water yeah. retention and the law? What is the main thrust of this, uh, of this uh, leading thinker, of his message? People who've never heard of him learning about him from us. I don't want anyone else to know about him. From the outset of this campaign, Donald Trump has made the strategic gamble that he can turn out an oversized share of this country's white working class voters. Trump's bet is that his appeal in the industrial Midwest and other areas hollowed out by the exodus of manufacturing jobs will make up for any shortcomings he's likely to have with moderate, minority, and well-educated voters. Now, a new book by 32-year-old J.D. Vance has managed to capture with striking precision the very people that Trump is hoping to carry him to victory. It's titled... Hillbilly Elegy, a memoir of a family and a culture in crisis. It's a personal story about Vance's own family, but the New York Times aptly describes it as, quote, a tough love analysis of the poor 
who backed Trump, calling it, quote, a compassionate, discerning sociological analysis of the white underclass that has helped drive the politics of rebellion, particularly the ascent of Donald Trump. Mr. Vance has inadvertently provided a civilized reference guide for an uncivilized election, and he's done so in a vocabulary intelligible to both Democrats and Republicans. I'm joined right now by the author, J.D. Vance. What is it that you're trying to achieve in talking about people you call hillbillies, rednecks, whatever? What are they, why did you want to write about that? What are you trying to get across to everybody else? Well, what I wanted to try to get across and what I wanted to try to explain is that these problems of inequality and upward mobility are really complicated. And I think that on, on the left, uh, we, we tend to have a conversation about what government isn't doing. And on the right, we tend to have a conversation about what individuals aren't doing. And it seemed to me that we weren't having a conversation about what both weren't doing and what both could do better. And so I, I thought that by opening up my own life and my own family and being very honest about my own problems, that, that I could ha be, be part of, of a better conversation. What do you think makes people who have it rough, they live out in the in mountains, they don't have jobs, they don't have beautiful homes, families that can sort of get educated and move ahead to the next generation, what makes them break bad? Because you're talking about people who live in the mountains and, and you're thinking about they do things that are self-destructive. What, what's the chicken and the egg answer here? Well, I, I think it's not just the people who live in the mountains, but it's the broad Appalachian di diaspora that, that have located themselves in Pennsylvania and Michigan, Ohio, Indiana, and so forth. So I think it is a, a broader trend. It's not just the people who are living in the hills. But I, I think the answer, again, is, is pretty complicated. W one of the things I realized in writing this book is that family breakdown and family chaos, which I thought of before I wrote the book as, as primarily a problem of individual character, it's intergenerational. It's that families pass yeah. on their chaos and their domestic strife to the next generation. And so it, with that, it, in the same way that a lot of other problems pop up and that have existed for many generations, it's just complicated. It comes from a combination of economic dispossession, but also learned helplessness and problems that people have acquired through their families and from their neighborhoods. I'm not finished the book. I'm just into it. But I, I've thought that one of the things we talked about this, uh, one of the people in our one of our producers who's from Africa, we talked about how the whites have a particular situation because they come up with the idea, OK, the white people have had advantages, privileges even in, in Western society. And if they don't make it, hey, what, what went wrong with me? And, and that's different than minority groups who never felt they had any special break coming to them. Now, when white country people see black people making it in society, when they see immigrants from South Asia or whatever, East Asia, making it in our society, see them on television in roles that are quite significant roles, do they get a special bitterness from that? I don't know if they get a special bitterness from seeing other people succeed, but I do think they get a special bitterness from the expectations that they had for their own lives not materializing. Yeah. So my grandparents really were optimistic about the future. They thought that their children would have the American dream, even though my grandparents were born in poverty in eastern Kentucky coal country. But it hasn't really materialized. And you think about yeah. these areas that have really suffered economically, that have stagnant upward mobility, it's a certain pessimism about what their own children and grandchildren will expect. And I think that's where the real bitterness comes from. You know, you talk about the values there that I consider like loyalty and honor. And, and, and loyalty and honor, I think, are great values. But you see in, in the culture you grew up in, that's a problem. They're a problem. Loyalty and honor. Absolutely. I think loyalty and honor are, are obviously great traits. And they're some of the things I took from my culture, that hillbilly culture that I love and really care about. But it, but it, it has its limits, right? So when I was five years old, Loyalty and honor meant that if someone insulted my mom, I had to punch him in the nose, and I got in a lot of fights because of that. But if you think about what that means in the context of a modern 21st century marriage, or you think about what that means in a corporate boardroom, conflict cannot be resolved like that. Successful conflict resolution requires a calmer head um, and cooler thoughts. And I, I think that's one of the things that I had to learn in my yeah. own life. And, and, and frankly, it's something that I didn't know growing up. It's something that I did. I had to adjust to. Yeah. <laughs> he's, so, he's so insignificant, truly. Yeah. Except for he's the best selling author. Except he gave birth to you guys. He launched you. <laughs> he's he's your Prometheus. Yeah, Sorry. exactly. Yeah, yeah. Right, right. <laughs> well, you can just tell us whatever you'd like. I mean, hopefully don't lie. Make Don't make it up. But, you know, anything you'd want to focus on, like any of the myths you feel like are are prevalent or any of the hot takes, the liberal hot takes that you feel like you need to really push back against, if you want to talk about it that way. And by the way, we can edit stuff out. So if, if we can't lie, I'm pretty sure this is over. Yeah, I know. <laughs> we're, 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 we're big storytellers. 
If I can't lie, I don't want to be part of your podcast interview revolution. You guys have a very oral tradition, right? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Right. <laughs> Yeah, no, okay, so yeah, I don't know where you start with J.D. Vance, but really, honestly, where it started was, I mean, Tom and I have had had a radio show for the longest time, um, and we kind of wanted to do the Chapo thing for the J.D. Vance Hillbilly Elegy book, but um, obviously, like, we're nobody, so we're not going <laughs> to be on that. Chapo. <laughs> if you are nobodies, you're certainly no more of a nobody than um, Will. Felix and Matt, and I say this, you know, they're friends of the show. They've done ours. We've done theirs. Hi, guys. Hey. Hi, Brendan. We'll throw you into. Oh, and of course, Amber and Virgil. <laughs> so uh, we were like, well, we can fucking do this. <laughs> we can just jack their stuff a little bit. Like if, if they're Def Jam, like right. we're like Def Jam Sal. Remember when I flew to Chris and all of them had Def Jam Sal from the mid up? We're very different from them, but. We have we thought we had the lived experience to be able to adequately roast that um, that book and uh, I don't know I think we we did a fairly good job of it yeah. and then just continuing from there just like I think we were just sort of put out by all the national media coverage of Appalachia and so we thought we had enough material to you know just keep going after that instead of just doing a one off and so. What are the most annoying, like, misconceptions that or myths that need to die that you encounter when you're talking to people, either liberals or also left people like, you know, Gabe and me? Because I'm not going to pretend that I don't have northern, northeastern privilege that I need to check. You're welcome. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, other than that, we don't listen to rap music. <laughs> So, yeah, obviously one of the biggest misconceptions um, and one that gets sort of bandied about in the liberal media is that this is Trump country. I think that, you know, obviously a lot of people here voted for Trump. Like, that's not – we're not disputing that. But, but more people didn't vote for him. But more well, – I mean, but, like, yeah, but if you look at the people who actually didn't vote uh, compared to the people who live here, uh, yeah, like, more people didn't vote at all. And um, I don't know, that to, that to us is just not really an indication that you can just write this place off as Trump country. But there's also like a sort of maliciousness to it as well. What do you mean? You know, I think that like part of the liberal, <laughs> I don't know, part of the liberal psyche is like sort of um, creating this uh, this other region that they can uh, just sort of punch down at um, for various reasons. I don't know. It's really pathological in a lot of ways i'm sure that you are yeah i mean it's, it's a cliche but you know even in the whole like i don't know how you want to phrase in this the era of identity politics like mm. it's never been you know not okay to punch down at poor whites you know in in that same right. way and I, I don't mean that in a in a race <laughs> like yeah no i know what you i know what you mean yeah i'm i'm always shocked and we talk about this a lot on the show I'm I'm always shocked by the kind of sadism, the outright sadism that uh, is allowed to exist around working class whites. You know, yeah, yeah, it's like, just yeah. totally unchecked. And yeah, yeah, totally. Like it's like the uh, like the cost thing, the dude that. Oh my yeah. god, Daily Coast, yeah, yeah. Marcos talking Molitas, about yeah. like the the black lung stuff and like you know how that you know they sh this is what they voted for, so they should just die. And it's just right. like that's just so fucking callous. Yeah, like, it's so wrong. <laughs> right. Yeah, it's wrong. I mean, we always say this, but it's wrong on a like an ethical level, right? There's just like who thinks that, but also again, like isn't that kind of part of the problem? With uh, if you want people to actually like vote for the non-Trump person, don't isn't that not a very good like voting outreach? Uh, get out the vote. Tactic, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're not winning very many hearts and minds, so. <laughs> right? It's 2017, um, and you know we still put people inside of mountains to get this rock out of it that we burn for energy. And I think liberals are very good at asking where their food comes from, but they're not very great at asking where their electricity <laughs> and energy comes from. Uh, it fucking comes from people dying every single day, getting black lung, like the smothering to death. Like it's not something you can just write off or, or something that you can just act condescendingly towards. I don't know. People die for, for like our country to be a modern country. But they die shrouded in white privilege. So, uh, <laughs> you know. 
tripping with. Yeah, and the cloak, and the cloak of impenetrable cloak right. of white privilege. Black, black long white privilege. It'll be there next. Oh yeah. Episode. <laughs> for, you guys should. That should be that's... the memoirs of the anthropology of Appalachia. Right. And even when there is recognition of mining culture, I feel like it's all uh, masculine. There, it's like there's very rarely mm. any recognition of women's work here. Um, we we like to joke that here work is masculine and welfare is feminine <laughs> in the mountains. It's like mm, right welfare queens. Yeah, yeah, welfare queens. Yeah, right. No welfare kings. Yep. There should be a prom, a welfare <laughs> prom, where there's a homecoming, a welfare homecoming king and queen, queen and king. Yeah. How can we get rid of sexism when we only have welfare queens? At the enchantment under the sea dance. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. um, but can you tell us about your backgrounds and how you got into this? And Just like reading various things, being surrounded by people talking about what's going on in the community around us, um, living in an area that has... Um, an astronomically high po- poverty rate. I mean, you live in an area that's quite literally, um, you know, it's been uh, exploited for a hundred years and more by um, outside coal companies. And, and that shows in all kinds of ways, uh, the lack of infrastructure, the lack of any kind of um, sort of capital funding money to uh, plot a future forward here. I mean, it's just, um, yeah, I don't know. I could keep going on and on. Yeah, it sounds it yeah. sounds like an internal colony. Like we have a colony inside the country where we're just extracting resources and not and no one who who actually lives there is getting the benefit from the economic windfall. Is that something? Well, and, and that's what, you know, that's that's a metaphor that's thrown around a lot and uh I mean, Barack Obama has said that himself uh in 2008. Hell um, yeah. I'm like Barry O. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Barry knows. Barry knows. Yeah, he said that in his prior. He he called it the Saudi Arabia of America. I believe, something is, I think, is what the yeah. Right. Uh, As in, like a country that is really bad, but and we pretend to condemn, but actually do business with. Yeah, yeah. Could you imagine if Trump came here and they all held an orb, but it was just a glowing rock of coal in a coal mine? <laughs> oh my god, that would be great. I feel like that's your new album cover, guys. Yeah, totes. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you work at um, the uh, Appalachian Citizens Law Center, which provides do, yeah. free legal representation for retired coal miners seeking federal black lung benefits. And you also have a cat named Leon. Hey, I do. <laughs> Your bio literally sounds like a country album's lyrics. Yeah. <laughs> it does. Well, I do development. We're a public interest law firm, which means we give free legal services to all of our clients. Eighty um, percent of our clients live below the poverty line, uh, so they don't have the money or the resources to uh, fight. When you when you apply for black lung benefits, the coal companies fight you legally in the courts, and you know a lot of the miners don't have the money and resources to hire their own lawyers, so they just go to us and we do it for free. Wow. So that must be what's that like? Because you're basically it's like you're ju- you're getting um, money for people who are basically condemned to to die early, right? That must be somewhat. I'm not. I'm not dissing what you do. I mean, it's super important, and we saw that during that town hall. <laughs> I'm like, whatever, no big deal. No, we saw that during yeah, the town hall where where that woman with Bernie and Sanders and and Chris uh, Hayes, where that woman was talking about. Okay, with the black lung before the Affordable Care Act, you know, President Nixon signed that the coal miners would be compensated for the health because their their life is going to be shortened by the black lung. And it does come from the occupation. President Reagan then made it so hard for the miner to prove he had black lung. It just could not even be done hardly. So then, when they were passing the Affordable Care Act, our Senator Byrd was wheeled out on the Senate floor in a wheelchair, and he got it that if a miner had worked 15 years in the mines, the burden of proof would go to the company to prove he didn't have the black lung instead of the miner having to prove it. Also, when the miner would die, the spouse had to reprove it. Senator Byrd got that part removed. Huh. But this is all going to die with the Affordable Care Act. I just want to be clear. If they pass this bill right now, if they repeal the Affordable Care Act, the expanded eligibility for folks with black lung 
for all the folks in this county and the neighboring counties and all throughout West Virginia and Pennsylvania and Kentucky and Tennessee that mine coal for years. It will, it will go back to being much, much harder for those folks to access benefits from the government. Is that right? Yes, and also we have these rural health clinics that treat these miners with this black lung disease. And, you know, it's very needed. That is mostly funded by the Affordable Care Act. That will go. And it was so horrific because clearly she was upset about black lung, but it was like that was just that's just built into the job. Right. So the issue was just like whether or not they were going to get some compensation. Yeah. yeah it's like several things. Um, the first thing is that uh, you can prevent black lung. Uh, Germany eradicated it. Well, you know that I don't know if that's such a good ex example, by the way. German eradication. Mm. <laughs> Problematic. <laughs> Sorry, I had to go get there. Oh, Maybe rework that a little yeah, bit. Yeah, have yeah. to beat me there. <laughs> um, I mean, you can you can do all kinds of things in the mining process to get to make sure that people don't get it. In this country, you know, we're just this free market hellhole where regulations are so minimal. Um, that's why we're seeing this insane spike in black lung lately. Like, it's like we haven't seen black lung levels. Like we see them now, we haven't seen them like this in like over 60 years. It's completely inexcusable and it's totally preventable. So what kind of stuff could be done to eradicate it here or to lower it here? So uh, there's all kinds of, there are dust monitors. There's all kinds of ways you can ventilate a mine. I know this is really, this is just really uh, in enthralling <laughs> stuff no, I mean, listeners. Yeah. Like, like, look, like, there's nothing that can be done. Canaries <laughs> is the height of technology. Yeah, right. Yeah, <laughs> we figured that out right. years ago, and it's a wrap. Yeah, yeah, you got a lot of these black lung conferences, and uh, you think this is boring. Um, <laughs> well, so yeah, no, you can like you can ventilate a mine in a certain way to make sure that your miners are exposed to less dust. They have monitors, they have face masks, all these other things. Um, really, they just so there. I know this is going to sound really dystopic, but there's an allowable amount of dust exposure uh, there's a little allow so um you know when upper big branch uh happened you know don blankenship the guy that just got out of jail right. on upper big branch um he killed like nine, 29 miners they did autopsies on all those miners in that explosion and like 19 of them had severe black lung wow. um and i think that was uh a pretty big kick in the pants for um the obama administration to do something about the allowable amount of dust in a mine so yeah there is something in this country called the um, respirable dust standard, and it's literally the amount of dust, coal dust, that you're allowed to be exposed to. Um, and right now, uh, they lowered it by like 0.5 milligrams of a milligram. I, I can't remember what it is, but essentially, it still allows you to have black lung. Right. <laughs> it's like we don't have. It's because like the the industry fought it so hard to make sure because it's you know it cuts into their bottom line when they've got to make sure that their miners don't uh, get black lung. So yeah. And yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, I'm like, I'm, whoa, I'm so sorry. And no, yeah, <laughs> no. I mean, the pun and it's it's a there's no incent, right? It's like whatever slap on the wrist they get for violating codes is is not as much. It's not a financially worth it, right? If you do the cost benefit analysis, they'll make more money just cutting corners and killing people, right? Right. Yeah. Um, you know, it's it's crazy, uh, you know, we that we mine coal or that we extract fossil fuels in general for profit. Right. Um, and obviously mountaintop removal is probably the sort of most popular example of what that looks like. You know what I mean? Like you mine in the cheapest way possible because you're mining for profit. And so that means more mechanization. That means uh, pe more people getting black lung. That means more streams are polluted and all that bad stuff. And so... Um, it's really quickly. Did yeah. you start out not like what is your family very different from you politically? Yeah, very, very different. Uh, my parents are very conservative. Um, actually, my dad is in oil field supply. Where I'm from is a, is a heavily uh, working class um, oil town, for better or for worse. I don't know how else to put it. Um, but yeah, he's in oil field supply. Um, and my grandpa worked for Chevron for like 30 something years. Uh, so yeah, I mean, like, there's definitely a pattern there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but yeah. Okay. Thank you. Next. So, uh, for me, um, I guess, um, I had, my family had always been sort of like New Deal Democrats mm. forever. 
and I grew up like in a single parent household in like the public housing system here. And so I think like for me, those experiences sort of shaped my politics. And, you know, I guess I just sort of got introduced to progressive politics pretty early on. And um, I guess like, um, you know, throughout my, like uh, when the Bernie Sanders campaign kicked off, you know, for the longest time, I just thought, okay, we just vote Democrat for lack of a, a, a better party to vote for. And then when Bernie sort of introduced a viable alternative, um, I sort of abandoned Clintonism. And, oh, yeah. Uh, Katie, ask him about the Clinton family. I was just going to say that, but I didn't want to blow up his spot, and I didn't know if you were get, like threats <laughs> yeah, yeah, from your listeners. Pull, but pull I see, yeah, I see in your bio that you. Uh, d- this is a safe space. We believe in redemption, even though we're not Christian. Um, we believe in the bi- uh, the gospels and stuff like that. So um, you did work for the uh, the Clinton Foundation. What was that like? Yeah, briefly. Um, briefly, yeah, it was. Uh, it was. It was it was interesting. I I was telling the story on the podcast the other day, and, and I pulled it back because I was like, well, maybe I'll save that for, for the Katie Halper Ooh, thing. But thank you. So uh, exclusive. There's this story. Getting exclusive, yeah. Yeah, it's getting exclusive. Yeah. So when I was there, I was like, um, I like helped out with like special events and like planning events and all this kind of stuff. <laughs> Nothing really like Help you know. People. Coats and cigarette holders, right? right. <laughs> lighted cigarette. I was, I was, I was the help. Right, uh, orbs, Saudi and, orbs. Yeah, Ed, <laughs> Chelsea Clinton had put on this, um, had had curated this exhibit. It was like a tribute to her grandparents on both sides. Mm. And, uh, and so uh-huh. the whole like Rodham clan came in for this, and like part of my my duties were to shuttle them around and. Uh, you know, bow to their every whim. Hell yeah, you were the <laughs> the Rodham Uber. Yeah, the, yeah. Rod, the Rodham Uber. So one time I'm I'm driving uh, Hillary Clinton's brother to this restaurant called Doe's, which is a, a great steakhouse in in Arkansas. And uh, he looks over at me and he says, "So what do you think about this Obama guy?" Mm. Like, really, what do you think about this Obama guy? And I just like, you know, like, well, you know, I, I voted for him in 2008, and then I'll probably vote for him again in the fall or whatever. <laughs> yeah. You were like, he's, he believes in change. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. and hope. Like, no, man. <laughs> hope, <laughs> change, hope be changing. <laughs> so, I, you know, he just kind of does this eye roll, and he looks at me and goes, I don't know. You know, kind of just like trying to bait me into asking him a question. And right. so <laughs> I say, yeah. Uh, well, you know, what's what's that relationship like there? What's that relationship like there? And he goes, I'm going to be honest with you, it's it's not very good. I'm talking about the, the Clintons and the Obamas. <clears throat> and he goes, let me ask you a question. He goes, have you ever heard of Madunga, Iowa? And I was just like, what the hell is this guy talking about? And I was just like, uh, no. And he says, well, Madunga, Iowa is where they filmed the TV show MASH at. And he looks at me, and I'm just like, I'm like wondering where he's going with this. He goes, now you tell me how that son of a bitch got 300 black school children to caucus in Badunga, Iowa. Ooh. <laughs> and I'll kiss your ass. Really? The Clintons have a, con- Clintons have a conspiracy theory, I guess. <laughs> Are, were they suggesting <laughs> blackface? Is that what his suggestion was? Again? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I feel like that's a this kind of a, that's email? more of a Bill Clinton thing yeah, this, to say. Yeah, than this Hillary. is nothing. This is yeah. This is, you can just yeah you know, scan through the emails. Oh, about it. Yeah. it would be great if they fired Comey and it all came down to Badunga, Iowa. Oh my god! <laughs> it's Blame it. Tom has for the Katie Halper show. Wait, but so this was a this was Hillary's brother because this sounds like a very like um, southern type of thing. You know, I, I feel like this sounds more yeah. southern than midwestern. Not to generalize, but it has a real southern charm to it. <laughs> But this is actually yeah. A, that's a probably Hillary that's brother. probably just my own flourish. Oh, I'm like, I'm like it's funny. The accent doesn't sound very midwestern. <laughs> I, I, I can't I can't do that. No, no, no. I know. I'm, I'm just pretending. I mean, you weren't yeah, pretending you to impersonate of, him, but. But younger. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Younger. I, that, that, there's the accent. I can't. Do One of you <laughs> did the Boston quote unquote did the Boston uh, accent the other day. It was hilarious. <laughs> It was much more New York. Um, that was me. Uh, yeah. I'd like to apologize. No, it's fine. <laughs> the, yeah. the, the old school radio announcer is the best. Uh, that was more like Staten Island. Really. Right, yeah. Sorry. I agree. But they're both harbors, I guess. 
Um, <laughs> There's water. Yeah, exactly. Um, and you work for, uh, and you you went to the same college that Billy Ray Cyrus went to? I did. Oh, and shit. I didn't even know that. Mm-hmm. And Chuck Woolery. <laughs> and did you meet and- out of them? Steve Inskeep. And Steve Inskeep, yeah. Steve Inskeep, yeah. We've got some, yeah. What, what was that, Kay? Did you meet, have you met Billy Ray at like a, at a, <clears throat> an uh, alumni event? Not, no, but I have, I did uh, once meet Randy Owen from the band Alabama. <laughs> nice. Uh, when I was, uh, when I was a, uh, a fraternity boy back in the day. Oh, wow. So, um, I apologize so, for that deficiency up front. Oh no, no, no! Again, we you have to infiltrate, <laughs> you have to infiltrate too. I'm sure I'm sure you were doing it as like a gender. Um, you were trying yeah. to deconstruct the binary by going undercover. Yeah, <laughs> no, that's exactly right. Yeah, I was, uh, yeah. And Tanya, what about you? Um, also, do you need to have a T name to work on your show? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We do like Willow. Can you, is can you get closer to the mic, Tanya? I think, or do you guys have three mics? Because I can hear you the least. The least yeah. here. How about speak now, Tanya? Is that better? Is that better? A little, yeah. Maybe. Okay. Way to silence oh, yeah, the woman. Yeah, they turned me down in here. It's a strategy. <laughs> That's not true. <laughs> they turned me down. They just shut my mic off all the time. <laughs> Erasure. Um. I don't know. I was raised by a lot of women. My family was kind of a matriarch, so I think that had to have something to do with it. Um, but um, I, have, I have two sisters, and uh, my mom worked in grocery stores. She still does work in grocery stores um, my whole life, and I was I spent a lot of time with my mama and my aunt, who we called Sissy. And she actually, this is my connection to the Clinton, the Clinton years, is uh, Clinton had this really good uh, daycare program where you could pay a relative to be your child care provider. And so my sissy Lisa was my babysitter my whole life, and she got paid by the government to be my babysitter. But she actually um, turned this into a racket, of course. (laughs) And so she Naturally. Was the babysitter. Like, there was like 10 of us at her house. Sounds, like, sounds like government waste to me. Yeah. J.D. Vance would not be happy. Yeah, we, were, yeah. we were a welfare clan, welfare queen clan. Um, so I just, um, she was just a really powerful woman and figure in my life. She like grew weed in her garden, hmm. among tomatoes and shit. So she was just, um, I think I just looked up to her a lot. She was a hard ass. Um, and so I like to say that I was raised by feminists, but they didn't know that word. You know, they didn't use that word. <laughs> right. Those are the best kinds. Um, <laughs> Everything was equal yeah. by default. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 But, um, I grew up in a trailer, and I was the first in my family to go to get a four-year degree. And so I went to a chief in-state college, uh, similar to Tom. I went to East Kentucky State you know, University. <laughs> Kentucky State. Kentucky State. Hell yeah. Yeah. No, EKU, Eternal Colonel. I was a colonel. Um, And um, I came back and started a lot of fights with my family because I was so smart. I come back all learned up. And I used to come back and shit talk coal mining. (laughs) And my uncle threatened to kick my ass in the back. And I finally shut the fuck up about it. Um, but yeah, I, I definitely felt like um, college kind of uh, threw uh, a wedge in between me and my family. But I had um, a few, I ended up, um, I was an education major, but I ended up switching to sociology because I realized I didn't want to teach um, or I didn't want to be in a school. Um, and I had a couple of Marxist professors. Mm. And I think that was probably the beginning of the end. So, oh, wow. I even had an affair with one of David. them. You had an affair with one of them? Oh, my God. Way to, way to make the uh, left men of the left look like the stereotype of the uh, <laughs> problematic. Yeah, really. Problematic, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, Are you yeah, guys still in touch? Um, and- you and Navikov? No, was it Navikov? He like party at his house every September, and he always be, every year he invites me to it. I've never been, yeah. and he just keeps inviting us when he has time every year when he has his soiree. You should go and warn the other women. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he got all the students there and be like. <laughs> he also to further the stereotype. He always smelled of 
coffee and cigar. Uh, I thought you were going to say patchouli or something. <laughs> um, anywho, I hope you never listen to this, dear God. I've already we're had huge exes contact in me. Kentucky, like, so he probably I've already will. had exes contact me saying, oh, I heard you talk about me on the podcast. Right. <laughs> Um, but then I, out of college, I got an organizing gig, and um, I was a community organizer for five years, um, and then started working for school systems, uh, which destroyed me. Mm. <laughs> now I'm doing development work at an arts and media institute. And you teach sexy but, um, sex ed workshops. <laughs> yeah, so in 2011, I started... Um, well, I was a part of this, like, founding founding this group called the Stay Project, Stay Together Appalachian Youth. You know, like, a big issue here is out migration. People kind of have to leave um, for a lot of reasons. Uh, and so um, we often, another big myth here is around this brain drain bullshit narrative about how, um, you know, the best and brightest leave and take all of our talent and blah, 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 and all our brilliance. So that whole narrative... <laughs> Just us numb nuts. Yeah, it's just our dumb asses. So right. that whole narrative kind of leaves the people who do stick around in the region um, or come back or whatever. And, you know, I think migration is, you know, probably one of the most normal things in human evolution. Like people should be, you know, people can migrate. I don't have anything bad to say about people who move uh, right. all around, move, leave, leave the region. But um, we were trying to change the narrative a little bit. Like some people do stick around and, um, you know, maybe it's not the best or leaving. It's <laughs> Right. Um, and maybe they don't anyway, have brain injuries. Long story short, yeah, long story short, we had summer, we would have a workshop every summer, like a week long camp that we would put on. Um, and we, in the registration, would say, What do you want to learn here? And people, several people would say, We want a sex ed. Like, we're not getting that at school. We'd love to have like a sexual revolution workshop or something. And, and that, so we poked around. Sounds like all different. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. I was going to say, oh, man, and that's a positive way to keep people invested in staying in the community. Yeah. They're all, yeah, uh, yeah. They're all, having, <laughs> they're all having fun also, orgasms with one another in a safe, yeah. and consensual, respectful yeah, also, way. I'm not sure, Gabe, you, that's not how sex ed works uh, outside of Washington, D.C., at least. <laughs> Maybe that's how it works in D.C. Gabe needs our consent workshop. <laughs> Do you guys? Do you guys? Oh, he's it? thinking uh, of the workshops. Like, oh, I see. Like, real sex is that that show on kinda, HBO? Kind of. I mean, yeah. yeah. You know, you're just teaching people how to have fun, good, good, responsible, playful sex. Right. And they'll they'll be like, you know, I I don't want to leave. That that'll go over. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, who? Are, how old are the people you teach this to? Um, it depends. Anywhere the youngest people in the workshops have been like 13, probably right. maybe a couple 12 year olds, but um. And it's usually really inter- intergenerational, and it's often older people, too. So, like, one workshop, I had a 14-year-old and a 40-year-old, and, like, everywhere in the middle. He um, was a Marxist really professor. Right? He was a Marxist professor, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he was there for the revolution. So. Yeah, exactly. it's, but <laughs> we, we created the workshop ourselves. Like, we cre- I created this curriculum because we couldn't really find anything that we felt like was right, and that um, carved out queer space. And mm. so it's getting better all the time. And Chris Day has ended up being this, this like mostly queer space. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone just comes to stay and comes out of the closet basically. Um, but we have all this like queer caucus scene and all this. But anyway, um, so yeah, the sex ed is a lot of fun. But when I worked at the school system, I was trying to like weasel the curriculum in somehow. Right. And um, I was eventually told that I couldn't say the words sex ed or birth control. Couldn't even say the words. Wow. In my official job capacity. <laughs> yeah, I worked there for like a year and a half. Yeah, so did you have any codes? Like, could you be like education <laughs> about relations or something? No, I just did. I just did. I just did it on my own time. Nice. I just, I like worked with the drop in centers. There's a lot of youth centers, like after school programs. And so I did a lot of workshops with them during that time. And she time. she drug us to those before and put us on the spot and made us draw uh, a vulva and stuff. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there's drawing. There's lots of drawing. We have skits. <laughs> yeah. Vulva, vulva um, skits? Uh, yeah. 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 Yeah, um, but yeah, it's mostly aimed at a younger audience. Um, usually when older people come, they're like, 
Well, older people actually never talk about this kind of shit, so they're usually really into it. But my friends, like my age, the, the late 2030s, are always like, oh, I thought we were going to like talk about positions and like, right. <laughs> something more. How to hit the G spot. Right. But it's really more like we talk about consent and we talk about body parts and trying to learn your own body. And So like it's our, our bodies ourselves kind of? Yeah, I mean, I kind of usually pitch it as in these times, we have to know how to love ourselves and each other in a healthy way. One, because we are told we're not, we shouldn't. And two, because they're taking our fucking health care. Right, right. <laughs> they want us dead. So we have to figure out how to love ourselves and <laughs> right. each other in safe ways. Or I'm going to have to turn my house into a clinic. I don't know what else to do. <laughs> t- when you said in these times, I thought you meant like the, the progressive magazine. I thought you were like, it's in these, it's like our bodies ourselves meets in these times. Um, <laughs> yeah, that would be great. Um, Isn't that a Wii magazine? No, it's just a, it's just a left magazine or it was until Sadie Doyle you know started writing there. Um, oh, okay. I oh, I get it. High times. Yeah. Anyway, we actually have to go, but we would love to have you on again. And that'd be great. Yeah. Well, thanks for having us on Katie. Yeah. Thanks Katie. Yeah, thank you guys so much for coming on. Yeah, Tom, Tanya, and Terrence. And Terrence. You guys are awesome. Yeah. Triple thank T's. You. Yeah, thanks, guys. Well, we'll talk to you soon. Great. Bye. Right. Bye. 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 Yeah. Hey, that was the Trill Billy's Workers Party. That was good. I learned a lot. Oh, yeah, man. But, yeah, Black Lung, um, a less serious discussion about Black Lung, of course, occurs in the film Zoolander. Mm-hmm, where mm-hmm. Uh, his father, he comes from a family of coal miners. Yeah. And uh, then he, you know, his, he tries to go mine with his family, and then they, uh, they're at a bar. They're like a very macho family. John Voight plays the father. Yeah. And they're watching TV at a bar, I guess a sports bar, and then they see a, a, a commercial that he's in, Ben Stiller's model Zoolander character. He's swimming around. And... Moisture is the essence of wetness. And wetness is the essence of... Of beauty. <laughs> Why do you have to come back to this damn town? Wanted to make a new life for myself. I'm sorry I was born with this perfect bone structure. That my hair looks better done up with gel and mousse than hidden under a stupid hat with a light on it. All I ever wanted to do was make you proud of me, Pop. With what? Your male modeling? Prancing around in your underwear with your wiener hanging out for everyone to see? You're dead to me, boy. You're more dead to me than your dead mother. I just thank the Lord she didn't live to see her son as a mermaid. Merman. (coughs) Merman. (coughs) Not a dry eye in the house. Anyway, um, this is the Katie Halper Show. Thanks so much for listening. Make sure you check us out on Patreon. That's patreon.com slash the Katie Halper Show. We also have our next live taping June 14th at 7 p.m. at the Brooklyn Commons. That's 388 Atlantic Avenue. And our guest will be Angela Nagel, author of Kill All Normies, and Freddie DeBoer, writer and all-around controversial dude. It's a special benefit for WBAI because WBAI, nonprofit, free speech radio. What's a better way to celebrate WBI through a one night only free speech event? And we'll be looking at the question of free speech. And to get tickets to that, that show, you go to facebook.com slash the Katie Helper Show. Facebook.com slash the Katie Helper Show. And you're going to see pinned to the top of the page an event. And if you click on that event, it will take you to where you can donate to the station. And in exchange for said donation, your thank you gift is a ticket. It's $10. $10 for not only a great live taping supporting a great cause. But then we have a little bit of stand-up and storytelling afterwards. And then karaoke, June 14th at 7 p.m. at the Brooklyn Commons. That's 388 Atlantic Avenue. 